So our title for the sermon today is Sky, A Skydiving World. So this morning, to fit the title, I'd like to tell you a story of a skydiving incident. So the story is about a woman by the name of Debbie Williams. You see, Debbie Williams, she's what you could call an expert at falling. Because she's an expert skydiver. And you see, her and, her and her friends, they were so good at skydiving that they, didn't, they no longer needed instructors to be on the back. And they no longer need, they, used, they have something called a line. Where there's a line when you fall a certain feet, automatically your parachute deploys. So her, her friends and her were so good at skydiving, they didn't need any of this. So one day, her friends and her are going out for your everyday normal skydiving adventure, as normal as falling thousands of feet can be. And, she, and her friends go before her, they're jumping out, and she's the second to the last one. The only one behind her is her instructor, uh, Gregory Robertson. So, you know, Debbie Williams, as normal, she jumps out, does all the right techniques. She's flying down and she sees her friends down below her. So there's something called a corkscrew, which you can do to help you pick up speed. So she does a corkscrew. And she's going at miles of 50, 50 miles per hour, trying to catch up to her friends. But something happens. She miscalculates how close her friends are. And at 50 miles per hour, she hits head first into one of her friends. Instantly, she's knocked out. And she's just flying limp, going down, down to the ground. Her instructor, who's above her, sees the whole incident and notices that Debbie's face has blood coming down it. And he says, oh no. Because at this moment, there are 3,000 feet in the air. And he knows that in just a few seconds, if someone doesn't deploy her parachute, she's going to die. So her instructor does what they call a no-lift dive where he points his toes, he puts his arms flat and his face down by his chest, and he flies down at, at speeds of 180 miles per hour. The whole time he sees the world getting bigger and bigger coming up to him, and he begins to maneuver with his shoulders to get right where Debbie is. And 12 seconds away from impact, he pulls her parachute cord. To Debbie, this was like Superman coming down to save her. But you know, how funny it is today, the world is just like Debbie. It's plumbing down to destruction. Yeah. And many people in this world, just like Debbie, are, in, are unconscious of this pending doom. But God, as, our, as our, our true and only Superman, and as our only hero, has brought his three fastest angels to come to this world to rescue us with a, what we call the three angels' message. And this message is found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 13. But before we dig into this three angels' message, let us again have a word of prayer and welcome God's presence into our hearts, into our minds. Let's pray. Yeah. Dearly Father, Lord, our only hero and Savior, Lord, as we dig into your Bible today, into your, God's, into your word, Lord, may you bless our hearts and our mind. May you open it so that we can see the message you have for us today. And even more, Lord, when we understand the message, may we spread it to the whole world. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In your name I pray. Amen. So today, join me in Revelation chapter 14. And in Revelation chapter 14, today we're going to go over the first of these three angels' messages and find out what this light-saving message truly is. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. God's word says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the, sp and the springs of water. So first we see here's this three angels' message. But there's two things we need to notice before we dig into this message. The first one is it said that he, the angel had with him the everlasting gospel. And what's the everlasting gospel? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
to die on a cross for you and for me so that we could have eternal life and be freed from sin. And just like in our lives, and just like in this message, if we lose the gospel, we have nothing. We have no power. We have no freedom from sin. So as we go through and we start to study this first angel's message, we have to keep in mind that the gospel is at the very core of this message, that Jesus died on the cross just for you and me. For the second part, if you notice it says, he had the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Huh. So is this a message just for the Cleveland First Some Damnedest Church? Is this a message just for Cleveland? Well, what about Johnson County? No? All right, what about Texas? Okay. What about the United States? No. What about just for Adventists? No. This is a message for the whole world. And this is a message that you and I need to be preaching. <clears throat> and if preaching even more, God has given us this message to proclaim to the whole world. If you look in your meditation, there's a quote from Acts of the Apostles, page 9. It's the first paragraph in Acts of the Apostles. And a summon of it says that we are God's agency to spread the gospel and the word of salvation to the whole world. God could have used an angel. Think how, how effective an angel would have been. If we literally saw an angel flying across in the air, saying, <coughs> preaching this gospel, say, with the everlasting gospel, and say, fearing God, give glory to him and worship him, I don't know about you, but I would do it. But God didn't use an angel. He used you and me. And before we can proclaim this message to the world, we have to know what the message we are to proclaim, right? It's kind of like this. Imagine you have a salesman who has just joined a new company, you know, a new product, and he has his bag, but he never took time to really look in the bag. So he used to work for, you know, a carpet cleaning company. So he's like, you know, it must just be carpet cleaner in the bag. So without even looking in the bag, he comes to the door, he knocks on it, and he says, hey, you know, I'm from the da, da, da company, and I have some carpet cleaner. Would you like me to test it out on your carpet? You know, free trial. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, he reached in his bag, and out comes bleach. How'd that work? In the same way, if we don't know our message, if we don't truly under the three, if we truly don't understand the three angels' message, all we'll end up with is a mess. So coming back to our verse, let's read it once again. It said, Then I saw another angel flying in midair. He had the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God, and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the seas and the springs of water. So in this message, there are three imperatives. And it is imperative that we understand these three imperatives. What's the first one? The first one is fear God. The second, to give him glory. And the third is to worship him as creator. So for us to understand this message, we need to understand the three imperatives. So what was the first one? Fear God. So what does it mean to fear God? Does that mean we have to be afraid of him? When God comes, we have to run in the closet? Respect. We know I praise the Lord because he gives us all the answers we could ever need in the Bible. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verses 18. <laughs> Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. It says, The nations were angry, were, were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants the prophets and your saints and those who fear your name. You know what's interesting here? The word fear and reverence in many of your Bibles can be interchangeable. But let's go, let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. Revelation chapter 19, verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne. Praise our God, all his servants. You who fear him. 
both small and great. One amazing thing is that God's last day people are going to fear him. And to fear him, that means to, re to revere or to respect him. But there's more. Turn with me to Genesis, the other side of your Bible, to Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. Genesis chapter 22, verse 12, the other side of your Bible. Mm -mm. And it's talking about the, the story of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 12, it says, Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld <coughs> from me your son, your only son. Now turn with me to Job. Turn with me to Job. Job chapter 1. And this is about in the middle of your Bible, right before Psalms. Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, we're going to read verse 8. Job chapter 1, verse 8. And he says, Then, then the Lord said to, to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So here we see that two of, the, two of the greatest people in the Bible, Abraham and Job, both feared God. But from this, what do we find that it means to fear God? In the story of Abraham, when Abraham feared God, he was able to give God, to surrender his only son to God. With Job, when he, with his fear for God, he was able to surrender not only his children, but his whole life to God. So if we are to fear God, we need to surrender our life to him. That's what fear looks like. And you know one of the greatest mistakes any Christian can do is to wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I got this. The moment you wake up and you're like, you know, I, I don't need God. That's like walking out without your armor on. And when the devil goes and shoots an arrow at you, you have nothing to protect you. That's why every morning when we wake up, the first thing we should do is say, God, here's my to-do list. Here's my schedule. Here's my plans. Here's my life. They're yours. I surrender them all to you. Because you see, if you fear God, you will surrender your will to him. But there's two more aspects. Go with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. It'll be chapter 5, verse 29. De Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. And it reads, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. But let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4. Just a few pages over. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4. And God's word says, it is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere or fear. Keep his command and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. So the second thing, if you fear God, what are you going to do? You're going to keep his commandments. And what are his commandments? Well, they're the Ten Commandments that we find in Exodus verse 20. So if we fear God, we're going to do what he tells us to do. We're going to put our lives in accordance with his Ten Commandments, with his moral code. So if we fear him, we're going to keep his commandments. Now the final one. Go back with me to Revelation chapter 11. I'm sorry, your Bibles are getting a workout. But go with me to Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. the last aspect of fear. And in Revelation chapter 11, verse 13, it says, At the very hour there was a severe earthquake, 
and a tenth of the cities collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. Hmm. Well, let's go to, let's go to Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. And in Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, it's God's word says, Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? So if you fear the Lord, what are you going to do? You're going to glorify him. But how do you glorify him? Well, in John 15, verse 8, Jesus himself said, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So if we fear God, we're going to glorify him. And how do we glorify him? By bearing much fruit. By telling the world about Jesus. And, when, and after they're baptized, not just, you know, ducking them and dropping them, but teaching them to do the same as you did, so that you both can become disciples for the Lord. And you know, as, as I was studying this fear, it kind of reminded me of when I was growing up, and my fear towards my parents. It's going to sound kind of funny, but when I was little, and I don't know if you were the same, but when I was little, I did good in the beginning because I was more afraid of the punishment than anything else. Because you see, my parents, they used to, I guess a good term for it was, spank me. And you see, through the years, they, they, they accumulated uh, quite a few torturous methods. In the beginning, it was just a hand, you know? But then they upgraded. They got smarter, and they got to the belt. But that, that, they didn't stop there. They got to the paint stick, the whooping stick. And what they would do is they'd go to Home Depot, and you know those, those paint sticks that you use for stirring paint? Well, my dad, he bought a whole bucket of paint sticks. And see, he was smart. He put it right by the door by his door. So when I get in trouble, he'd say, go to the room, go to our room. And I'm like, yes, sir. And when I walked by, I would see the paint sticks. I would see my doob. It was right there. But you know what? I learned my lesson. But you know, something interesting happened. You know, when you grow older, you get hopefully a little smarter, a little more mature. And as I grew up, you know, I, my fears shifted from being afraid of the punishment to being afraid of disappointing my parents. Because you see, my fear for my parents and the punishment, when I got older, I, I realized that they were just trying to, to help me become a better person. That they were punishing me because they loved me and I praised them for it. Because if they, if they didn't spank me, I don't know where I'd be. But my, my fear became respect. And my respect became love. So you see, when I got older, when I got to high school, my friends were doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. I didn't do, I, I, I said no, but the reason I said no wasn't because I was afraid of the punishment if I got caught. The reason I said no is I knew if I did it, I would hurt and disappoint my parents. And you see, it's the same thing with God. If our fear is only the fear of punishment, <laughs> we're missing the whole picture. But it's when our fear becomes respect that turns to love. Then we do what's right. We do his commandments. We love others. We make disciples. Not because we're afraid of hell. Not because we just want to go to heaven. But because we want to make our father proud. And once you, your fear goes from punishment to disappointment, then and only then do you understand what it means to truly fear the Lord. But there's a second imperative. And you remember the second one, one was? Give glory. Give glory. Glorify him because his judgment has come. Hmm. So his judgment has come. That's past tense, right? So when did, his, when did his judgment come? We're supposed to glorify him because his judgment came. Well, when, when this judgment happened, well, first, let's just, let's just look at what is the judgment. So go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. 
chapter 12, verse 13. Ecclesiastes, <coughs> right after Proverbs, in between Song, Song of Solomon. <coughs> and God's word says this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And in verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Okay. Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Five, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Right after 1 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due for him, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So the judgment we see here, the reason we're supposed to glorify God is because it has come. <laughs> It said the judgment is that for every deed, everything we did while on this earth, good or bad, will be on judgment. And it said that it will be before Christ. So it's before Christ. When could this have happened? Did it happen when Jesus was here? Well, let's find out. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. And in Matthew 12, verse 30, uh, 36, Jesus said himself, But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every, every careless word they have spoken. Hmm. So it has not come yet. So maybe it came after Jesus went to heaven, right? So maybe during Paul or the disciples' time. Well, turn with me to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, verse 25. Acts chapter 24, verse 25. And God's, God's word says, As Paul discoursed on the righteousness, the self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will sin for you. So when Jesus was here and when, when Paul was here, the judgment hadn't came yet. But then in Revelation 14, it says the judgment has already come. So when could this judgment happen? Well, you know what? I praise God because he doesn't do anything in secret. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. <clears throat> In Daniel 8, verse 14, God's word says, He said to me, It'll take 2,300 evening and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And as we read this, we need to remember that this prophecy was written to the Israelites, to the Jews. So when they heard that the sanctuary was to be cleansed, you know the first thing that went to their mind? The Day of Atonement. You see, on the Day of Atonement, that was the day that the sanctuary was cleansed. But even more, it was known as the Day of Judgment. So I want you to imagine for a second when the Israelites had read this, that this would be the first thing they would have thought of, and they would go back to Leviticus, so turn with me to Leviticus chapter, uh, chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 and 30. Because imagine when they heard this, their, heads would have went, their minds would have went to this scripture as they thought about it. And in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 and 33, Leviticus chapter 16, verses 29, 33. God's word says, This is to be a lasting ordinance for you, 
on the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourself and not do any work. Whether native born or an alien living among you, because on this day of atonement will be made for you to cleanse you, then before the Lord you will clean you, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of rest, and you must deny yourself. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest <clears throat> the priest is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make an atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the people of the community. So when they had read this prophecy, their mind would have went to the day of atonement. And for a second here, I'd like for you to open up your mind's eye, open up your imagination. I'd like for you to experience what a, the day of atonement would have been like for the Israelites. So you can close your eyes, just please don't fall asleep. But imagine, this is what a day would be like. On the Day of Atonement, imagine you're an Israelite, and the sun is gliding down the hill, the western hills of the land. And on the ninth day of the seventh month, you'd hear a trumpet be sound throughout the whole camp. And as soon as you heard this trumpet, you realize that it is the Day of Atonement, and all work will be put aside. But you see, it wasn't just like any other Sabbath. So don't give me a crazy idea to say, I'm only going to worship on you know, the seventh month, the ninth day. That's the only day I'm going to go to church. But you see, this day was not a day of feasting like normal Sabbaths were, but it was a day of fasting. And the, Israel, and the Israelites would stay in their tents. It'd be quiet and solemn. And they would re read the passage that we had just read there. And they would search their hearts for any sins that they had against the Lord. And while the whole family was there reading the scrolls, praying, searching their hearts around them, they could hear the buzz of the Gentile homes. They could hear the distractions. But you see, the Israelites wouldn't go out of their tents because they knew if they went out of their tents, they could get distracted. They could start going back to their busy life, but instead, they were searching their hearts for any sin, anything that was separating them from God. So as the tents were all quiet in the sanctuary, it wasn't so. There was a buzz. It was busy because there was lots to do on the Day of Atonement. So what they would do is they would pick <clears throat> first the high priest would sacrifice a bull for his sins and for the sins of his family. Then they would pick two goats. And by lots, the one that fell on the, for the Lord, this goat would be sacrificed before the Lord. Then his blood would have been collected in the censer. And the high priest would have entered the sanctuary with the, blood, with the censer of blood. And he would have put some incense in, this, in the censer so that there would be smoke filling the sanctuary. And with his back towards the sun, he would have sprinkled the blood on the Ark of the Covenant seven times. And then he would have worked his way backwards. And finally, when that was done, when the sanctuary was cleansed, they would have gone the other goat and they would have assembled all the Israelites to get together. And on this goat, every Israelite would place their hand and they would transfer all their sins to this goat, the scapegoat. And then they would lead the scapegoat into the wilderness. And you know what the interesting was, thing was? The solemn day, the day of being quiet, of searching heart, went from being a solemn moment to a rejoiceful, a rejoiceful moment because the whole community of Israelites understood one thing, that, that they had just experienced atonement. Which, what does that mean? Let's break it down. At one meant. There was nothing separating them from God. All their sins had been cleansed. And during this time, they'd experience the peace of knowing that they are at, at one mint with their God. So as the Israelite would have read this prophecy, this is what scene would have flashed through their mind. But if you go back to <coughs> Daniel chapter 18, verse 14, it says 2,300 days, and then it'll be cleansed. Well, for sake of time, because I, I, I don't want the potluck to get cold, 
We made a, a fancy dancy little chart for you. If it'll work. Oh, go back one, please. Perfect. And I hope you can see this because in the prophecy, it said that the days would happen when the, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem would happen. And this happened in 457 BC. And I'm sorry I can't go into it deep as much as I'd like to because you'd be here all day. But if you are interested in it, um, starting in February, I'll start, uh, um, I'm going to be teaching a small group that will be going through the sanctuary and through many of these prophecies. So if you're interested, talk with me later and we can get you in. But the decree happened in 457 BC. So the next one, please. So 457 BC minus 2,300. And you've got to remember that a day equals a year. So if you minus that, you get 1843. Okay. If you looked at, your, at our chart, it said 1844. How, how could that be? Well, next slide. There's no 0 AD. So you have to add one. So if you add one, it'd be 1844. So when did the judgment happen? 1844. And if you know Adventist history, on 1844 was the great disappointment. Because you see... Our four, the forefathers of the Adventist faith believed that the sanctuary was the earth. But turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 14. Hebrews chapter 9, <laughs> verses 11 and 14. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 14, it says, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. That is not man-made. That is to, <coughs> to say, not a place of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats or calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of the goat and the bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that, all, that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanse our conscience from the act that leads to death so that we may serve the living God. And continue down with me to verses 23 and 24. It is not necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with the sacrifices by, uh, by, by these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Our forefathers were waiting for Jesus to come back. They thought that the earth was in sanctuary. But as we read in Hebrews, there is a heavenly sanctuary. So if judgment has already begun, it begun in the heavenly sanctuary. The day of atonement, what does that mean for us? That means just like the Israelites, so is the time we're living in today. Just as the Israelites was spend, uh, just like the Israelites on the day of atonement, we're searching, for, searching their hearts for sin. We're fasting. We're keeping themselves from evil. So in these last days, we must be. Because judgment has come. And none of us know when our case will come before Jesus, our high priest. So every morning, just like we said in fear, we must say, God, here's my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Because you see the heavenly sanctuary is being cleansed from all sins. The books are open, the records are made. So when Jesus comes back to this world, those who are righteous will be righteous. And those who are wicked will be wicked. So right now, this is why it's so important that we preach this message. Because the time is short. And I'm sorry I'm not a fear, one of those fear factor preachers. But I believe in being realistic. Because realistically, the time is short. Amen? But this week, we had baptismal class with the CACS students. And I learned one thing, that even though time is short and our case could be before Jesus, we have nothing to fear. For Jesus is our judge, our defense attorney, 
and our best friend. What is there to fear? And the last imperative is God as creator. Worship him who created the heavens and the earth and the springs of water. It's interesting because from this quote, the editors of the Greek New Testament from the United Bible Society. So this isn't just me saying. This is from scholars that are way smarter, way brilliant, brillianter than I am. That's not even a word, sorry. <laughs> Show in the margin that this statement is a direct quotation from Exodus 20, verse 11. So to worship God, and going back to Exodus 20, 11, what does that mean? We need to worship him on the Bible Sabbath. And what day is that? The Saturday. It's the seventh day. And you know why this is so important? Go with me to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It says, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. And lastly, turn with me to James chapter 2, verse 10. James chapter 2, verse 10. James chapter 2, verse 10. And God's word says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. My friends, God's last people are going to fear him, are going to have the faith of Jesus, and they're going to keep his commandments. And my friends, that's why this last, this first of the three angels' message is so important. They need to know that the seventh day Sabbath is the Sabbath. And to close, I want to tell you one more skydiving incident. I'm not against skydiving, I swear. But the last skydiving incident is about a lady by the name of Sandy. And you see, Sandy had been trying to become better at skydiving. So she'd gone with instructors, and she'd mastered that. She'd gone with the line, where the line that pulled the parachute for her. She got good at that. So finally, it was her first time to go by herself, where she gets to pull the cord. So excited, her friends wait for her at the landing pad. They see the plane up above, and there goes Sandy. She's going down, and they see there she is at the 3,000 feet mark, now at the 2,000 feet mark, now at the 1,000 feet mark, but they notice something, no parachute. And there she keeps going, 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 until she gets to the zero feet mark, and yet no parachute. Her friends are horrified, so they run to her thinking, what happened? Had they forgotten to put a parachute in her backpack? They open up the backpack, there's the parachute. They turn her around, and horrified, they see on her left side that she had scratched through the strap, she had scratched through her clothes, and she had scratched through her flesh, desperately trying to pull the cord. But there was one problem. The cord was on the right side. You see, my friends, it's the same with the world today. Some people are unconscious of what's coming. They don't see the destruction that is looming. But yet others are desperately pulling on the left side when the cord's on the right. And my friends, this is the three angels' message that we have been given and that we need to tell the world about because God has given us this mission, this one purpose on this world, is to tell people about him. The other day, I went to the conference office and I was talking to one of the secretaries there. And she says, you know, everything we do is for ministry. She's like, it doesn't, because her son's going to the university at Southwestern. And he didn't know what he wanted to be. And she said, son, I don't care what you are. Just everything you do has to be centered around ministry. And my friends, how much more is that for us today? Everything we do has to be centered around ministry. And my friends, if our life isn't centered around ministry, I'm afraid that we may be the ones who are desperately pulling on our left side 
and forget about the right. Because we have one purpose, and that's to tell the whole world that Jesus is coming soon, to fear him, to glorify him, and to worship him. Because this place right here, this isn't our home, but our home's in heaven. So I have an appeal for you this morning. You know, Christmas starting, and so comes New Year's, where you make New Year's resolutions. Well, I'd like to add something to your New Year's resolution. God has a ministry for you. What that is, I don't know, but God does. And each and every one of you have a different ministry. And my appeal for you today is, for, you, for starting the New Year's, for you to prayerfully consider God, where do you want me? What is my ministry? If you have no clue where to start, <clears throat> you can help with Pathfinders. You have Adventurers. You have Sabbath Schools. You have Women's Ministry. You have Young Adult Ministry. You have Youth Ministry. You have the Hope Clinic. You have our children. You could be a Glow Track missionary. You could be a literature evangelist. You could be a small group leader. You could be a teacher. Or you could just be a neighborhood missionary. And God has a mission just for you. So to close my appeal for you, if you are willing to please stand, if you are willing to, during this, this month, to prayerfully go to God and say, God, what is, my, what is your ministry for me? If you're willing to do that, I'd ask for you to please stand. If you're not, it's okay.